Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, today we will talk about a concept which preoccupied everybody in the world and there are a lot of suggestions and ideas and uh, new and old experiences. The concept of no bone loss and tissue loss, what do we know? 2020 and how can we achieve it? Our goal will always be to find clinical methods which create and maintain crystal bone loss. So let's see in the next hour how can we move forward with this concept and how can we try to find clinical predictable long-term solutions. Of course, I welcome all ICOI members and everybody else in the world. Uh, just to inform you that the ICOI is the biggest implant society internationally and we deliver education in 100 countries and we are very proud to be uh, one of the first international and the only one until now delivering education to the world of implantology. And of course, there are some other advantages being a member. The topic which I chose, no bone loss, we will deal with three questions in the next hour. Do we need a concept for no bone loss? This is the first question. The second one is when do we need a no bone loss concept and third one is how can we use it in the daily practice. There are a lot of new books, articles and creative inventions concerning bone and soft tissue loss. But what I will show you in the next hour is focusing on long term success. I'm not looking for a picture which is shown like one hour after surgery, two hours after surgery, or even three months after surgery. I think that our responsibility towards our patients and our global partners is to show long-term success. Because if we go through all those surgical procedures, we need to, to guarantee to the patient that it will stay there almost forever. So we divide the dentistry in three groups. The first one, and I just marked it with green because this is what we need to do, is evidence-based. Evidence-based means it's multiple centers, long-term success, and in every country and continent in the world, it works. It has been published, it has been researched, and we can use it in a predictable way. The second level is open, is practice-based. Practice-based means that each of us, of you, are doing procedures in your offices which work for years and are very predictable in your hands, but it's not yet tested by other colleagues, by other centers, and by research projects. So this can become evidence-based after a protocol and a research project. The lowest level is opinion-based. Opinion-based means that somebody is telling you that everything works what you do in the mouth of your patient. An example, you work on all on four, somebody will come with all on three, a lot of people talk on all on two, and one person I know talks on all on one. So the question is, does it work in every office? Does it work in every patient's mouth? The answer is maybe. So we have to go and to research all those ideas and find out how does it work. So begin with the end in mind. Every time we start a treatment on implants is exactly the same goal we want to get. We want to get fantastic papillas, excellent soft tissue and a long-term success. The question is how can we go there 
And do we have solutions which stay forever? I think that I can tell you at the beginning of this lecture that we don't have solutions with zero bone loss, zero soft tissue loss, and no complication. If somebody suggests that you go for zero bone loss, it's unrealistic. It's a nice topic to make marketing with it, but it's not working in the daily practice. In the daily practice, we deal with three groups of components when we talk about implant cases. The first group is the patient level factors. We need to know the age, the gender, if it's a smoker or non-smoker, the medical history, drug history, and the history of periodontitis. We must analyze the case until we know exactly where to go. If it's a smoker, it's a different uh, treatment concept than if it's a non-smoker. The age of the patient is crucial. Periodontitis history is crucial. So those are the groups which has to be analyzed before we start the treatment. Second is the implant level factors. We need to know the position of the implant. We need to know the duration of the surgical procedure. If you know that it's an old patient with high risk factors, I am sure that a six hour surgery will not be indicated. So we have to know exactly how long we need, how risky is the procedure, and how stable is the patient. The third one is the brand. We need to find brands and to use in our offices only brands, and this is my personal opinion, which are internationally available. If your patients are traveling and you use a system which is not in only country, and your country, this is the number one, I don't care, because your patient will travel to another country, nobody can restore it. I see it every day. 70% of our patients are international, and sometimes we fight to find the implant system, the diameter, the parts, and everything else. So it has to be a name and a brand which exists all over the world with long-term quality, long-term research, and innovative parts. And, of course, I'm using only conical design implant outside, and in my hands, I prefer to use the HEX, the normal 2.5 HEX connection, the classic one, which covered about 80% of the implant systems. We did some research projects with uh, Tel Aviv University, and there are no difference between the stability, but with a more stable design, you can get problems on the long run, and of course, it's more complicated for impression and for all the daily procedures. And last but not least, the antagonist. If you have a full dentures antagonist, you don't have to worry about the stability of the other jaw. But if the patient has his own teeth in one jaw, or even zirconia bridges or crowns, you have to increase the number of implants and to talk to your lab about the stability of the prosthetic construction. So antagonist is very important for us. And the third factor is the site level factor. Do we have recession? Do we need to do some surgery to improve the soft tissue prior to the implant placement? Do we have pockets? Do we clean the pockets before? Yes. Do we eliminate the pockets before? If possible, yes. Do we do an augmentation prior to the implant? If it is an aesthetic zone, I suggest to do a two-stage procedure to make the augmentation, to improve the soft tissue, and then to insert your implant. Bleeding on probing, it's always a sign of infection. So if we have bleeding on probing, we have to eliminate the bleeding on probing. We have to treat the perio disease. We have to solve the problem before we insert implants. I see a lot of cases with infections around it and at a wonderful implant in the middle of an infected area. So we have to eliminate all infections prior to the surgery. And of course, interproximal versus approximal bone, we need to try to elevate the bone level before we do the surgery in order to have a long-term success. As I mentioned at the beginning, 
we would like to show you long-term success or long-term complication or long-term failure. So if you go into the implant literature and if you look at the presentations we have, there are very few cases over five, seven or ten years. So during this presentation I want to share with you the long-term cases because this is where we will end. We are not ending in a kind of one month, three months or one year. So what I want to focus now in this lecture is that for me personally, and I know a lot of people will not accept it, will not admit it, Facebook, Instagram, it's not a medical university. This is just an ego trip. Everybody put his cases there. But at the end of the day, if we want to implement in our daily practice some system, some methods, they have to be published, researched, and at least practice based on multiple centers. So this is a case I did with Dr. Ormianer. He was the prosthodontist. I did the uh, surgical procedure. It's a patient with, as you can see, aggressive periodontitis. She was at the time of treatment about 54 years old. Aggressive periodontitis, mobile teeth, pus coming out of the pockets, and of course, we have to find a solution because her expectations are very clear. Having a fixed denture, fixed bridges during the whole treatment procedures. So what are the possibilities in such cases to deliver what the patient expects. So first of all, we make a treatment plan which shows us in a digital way how can we solve this problem. So selective extractions or multiple extractions. We show the patient all possibilities all treatment possibilities. This is, I think, legally important in every country. So we show the patient on a digital uh, picture, digital from Dental Master, uh, a software available for our members, of course. Um, how can we deal with full extraction and full denture, or four implants, a removable denture, bar, and all on four as a possibility and multiple implants as another treatment plan. Together with this patient, we decided on multiple implants. The reason to decide for multiple implants, it's very simple. Since you will see the results after 10, 15, or 18 years, you will understand that after 40 years of implant placement and about 40,000 implants I placed, I see that if we go for less implants, I mean all on four or all on three or whatever we are trying to do, this can be very challenging because the patient is 54 and the implant prosthetic restoration should stay there for at least 15, 20, 30 years. The moment you reduce the number of implants, you are getting yourself and the patient in troubles. Absolutely convinced. If you lose one of the implants in the next 5 or 10 years, the patient will be transformed in a removable prosthesis or you go to zygoma implants or you need major surgeries and major complications are possible. So we need to understand that multiple implants in our hands as somebody like Alain Simon Pierre and others, this is for me the only treatment plan for a long-term success. So we decided with the patient that we will do at the beginning a selective extraction. The infected teeth will be extracted the areas will be augmented, patient becomes antibiotics, 
cleaning of the soft tissue of all infections, and the patient goes home with a temporary bridge on 60s upper jaw and 3ts lower jaw. The next step will be six months later, we remove the, the uh, remaining teeth, insert implants and upper jaw and lower jaw, and continue uh, restoring it with a temporary bridge. Six months later, the patient becomes the full restoration in uh, ceramic fused to metal. As I mentioned at the beginning, I did the surgery, Dr. Mianer did the prosthetic on this case, and he is the person who does, who does the follow-up. So this is the first clinical uh, stage. After extracting teeth, augmenting the areas, both sides sinus elevation, as you can see here, and metal frame supported temporary bridges. Six months later, insertion of the implants in the lower jaw and upper jaw. Upper jaw, we used temporary abutments, and in the lower jaw, we used plastic abutments. It was a research product we did at the time. So you can see the metal frame, temporary bridge. One, two, three, four, five implants have been immediately loaded with one tooth to support the posterior, and the other implant didn't have the 35 newton centimeter insertion tore, so we didn't load them immediately. Same in the upper jaw. We implemented six implants in the temporary bridge, and we left three implants which were inserted in the sinus with no immediate loading. And six months later, this is the situation we had. Day one after inserting the, the, uh, the prosthesis. And this is a few years later, five years later. The difference in the color is due to changing the camera system. Dr. Miana bought a digital one. He was very excited to use it. And this is just the reason the color has changed. But as you see here, there are little resorption already. After five years, it still looks good. So we can show you that we have no bone loss and no soft tissue loss. But in order to convince you, we need to use Photoshop, which we never use in our cases, in our presentations. So this is after one year of loading. This is after 10 years of loading. We see apparently no bone loss on the mesial and distal sides. Now, if you look at the clinical pictures, this is day one, this is five years, and this is 15 years follow-up. What you can see here, we lost soft tissue and bone, mostly on the buccal area in the aesthetic zone of the upper jaw. And we have little bone loss in the lower jaw because of the actual loading, and here we have about 30 degrees inclination. So the reason for the bone loss, now 15 years after, we know much more about what happened. And I will share it with you because this is our goal, to show you what we did wrong in order to avoid for everybody in the world to do the same mistakes. First of all, the implants were inserted too much to the buckle. This is the first issue. Second, the abutments were too bulky. We used at that time gold abutments, and they were too bulky. Today, as I will show you immediately, we insert the implants much more to the palate, and we use completely different abutment design. So this is the way after 18 years. So what you can see here, the patient still wears the, the prosthesis. She has a low lip line, because of the advanced age, but we can do better. So we published uh, with Dr. Miana 2012. In the meantime, we have over 20 years of experience on our implant cases, and we have multiple cases we will present, but not this presentation, it will be too much. But you have to understand that when we published in Jomi 2012, we had 141 implants in perio patients. Bone loss per millimeter, no statistical difference, but more occurrence, 2.9% of bone loss, more than two millimeter in perio patients. 
So the difference between a non perio patient and a perio patient are two millimeters in those cases, but still the implants are in function. This is important to know. Now, we understand now that we need something to avoid bone and soft tissue loss. After looking at our cases back 20 years, we need to find some solutions. But the exact solution is when do we need it? When is, will be the exact point to change the concept? We did a statistic in multiple centers in Germany. There were about 8,000 patients involved. And we asked the patients, what are your expectations from a dental implant prosthetic treatment? And we were surprised by the numbers. And it will show you which patients do you have in your own office? Which cases do you have in your daily practice? Because for me, the answers came from this statistic were crucial to make decisions. So the first group, which are only 3% of our patients, said, I want the latest and best techniques. It means they want the most advanced technology, the newest implant systems, and they want to have their papilla restored to the micro. They are between 20 and 40 years old, 70% male, 30% female. Those are the patients which are willing to go through surgical procedures, to go through expensive procedures because this is what they want. They are very demanding. And if I have patients like this, most of the time I send them to Dr. Steigman because he deals with them. If I think it's an easy case, I'll take it. But we deal with 3% of the cases. The second group, 5%, type 2, they said, I want aesthetic and function. Between 20 and 60 years old, 45% male, 55% female. So what does it mean? It means that they want to get old. This is like every patient in the world, but nobody likes to look old. So we have to give them some solutions, make them look younger, and giving them the functionality. So we talk about 8% which are really keen to get high-end reconstructions, but the first group go on unlimited surgery, the second one will be more defensive. Now, type 3, 17%, I don't want to get older. Give me some solutions so I feel younger. Between 40 and 60, 30% male and 70% female. So we have to find solutions to give them some aesthetic appearance which fulfill their expectations. Still demanding, but not as much as the first two groups. Now, the fourth group, which are 40% of our daily patients in the praxis, they come desperate. They say, they tell you, I have to do something. I lost my teeth. I lost my job, I lost some confidence, we need to give them some solutions. And of course, 50%, 50 years plus, 50% male, 50% female. We need to give them some solutions, but not the high end. So we have to reduce the number of surgeries, the number of appointments, and the financial stress for the patient. The last group, 35% of our patients will come with no teeth or a few teeth in the mouth and a lot of social and, and, and other problems in their lives. And they will tell you, I need a solution. Please, doctor, help me. So we need to find solution for this group of patients. They are 68 years plus and 45% male, 55% email. So if you look at this statistic, 92% of our patients need a solution, more or less aesthetic. 8% of our patients would like to have high-end treatment and high-end surgeries. Especially now, this lecture, it's, it's in the middle of the corona pandemic. I can put a mask and talk to you 
with the mass, so you will see that the corona already hit the world. But if I respect the coronavirus concept and I try to find solutions for my patient, for myself, for my team, for the world, we need to reduce the number of appointments. A patient cannot come as before, like five, ten times traveling or coming to your, to your office. So if I can reduce the appointments, I will be more than happy to do so. Secondly, if they are elderly patients with high risk factors, we must consider every single surgery, if it's necessary or not. And last but not least, I reduced in my practice the number of immediate loading. I reduced it because a lot of our international patients are not even able to come back for control of the wound, occlusion, complication, abutment loosening, whatever can happen, as you very well know. So what we do today, we use a temporization with a flexible denture, Valplast, printed through the Sirona machine, and this is what I think should be the solution in many offices today. We have to change our treatment co concepts, especially now, following the corona cases we may have in our offices and the indication and the suggestions. This is not the topic. I will not talk about what we do in the office to avoid it, but at the end of the day, we must adapt the treatment concept, patient expectation, and the knowledge about the infection COVID-19. Now, the next most important topic in this presentation is the pink aesthetic score and the white aesthetic score. So every case we are doing in our offices should be evaluated based on those numbers. So it's not like my case is nicer than your case and my car is nicer than your car. We have clear numbers and clear founded research published by Urs Belzer and, and it's very clear to understand that the white aesthetic score has five points to evaluate between zero, one and two. It's the tooth form, it's the outlined volume, it's the color, it's the surface texture and the translucency. So you can evaluate now every case in your practice. Now, if you talk about the pink score, we need to understand that there are five major points on the pink score. The color, the volume, the curvature, and the zenith of the crown. If we don't achieve it, we cannot give ourselves a 10. So it will be a seven or an eight or something similar. But I think that today, with our knowledge, with the criteria we have, we can evaluate every single case with the pink aesthetic score and white aesthetic score. Another important parameter in our daily practice is the biological width. If we go into the literature, the implant articles will suggest to get three millimeters of biological width. One millimeter sulcus, one millimeter epithelial attachment, and one millimeter supercrystal fibers. It sounds good, it looks good, but in the daily practice, it's not always possible. It will be fantastic to have it in every case. But if you go in the literature, uh, uh, an article published 1994 by Vacek showed us that the biological width in humans it's between 0.75 and 4.33. It means that we may have patients with 0.75 biological width, very thin biotype, and it will be difficult following the rules to create a three millimeter biological width. So we will find methods, and I will share it with you, how we can create artificially the three millimeters 
biological width. Now this is concerning the vertical position. But not only the vertical position is important, also the palatal and, and buccal position. So what we suggest today to keep the long-term success is we need at least two millimeters from the implant to the buccal plate in every case. In the aesthetic zone, I will suggest three to four millimeters to have a long-term success. And when I talk about long-term, is a minimum of five to seven years, we need to have three to four millimeters of buccal bone to preserve the hard and soft tissue. And if we insert an implant in an extraction socket, the shoulder of the implant should be at least one to two millimeters below the buccal plate. The distance between an implant and a natural tooth should be between 1.5 and 2 millimeters. And we have to focus on it. It's unpredictable to keep 4 millimeters to one tooth and 1 millimeter to the other. So we must calculate prior to the surgery the implant position from the vertical point of view, from the buccal, buccal palatinal point of view, and from the mesiodistal point of view, as we will see immediately. This is a case which was once published as an aesthetic case, but if we go into details, it's not exactly what the patient expected. So this is the real smile of the patient. This was the picture. And if we look at the implant position, and if we look at the result, we cannot fix it without redoing the case completely because the distance between the implant and the natural tooth is about four to five millimeters at least. Then we have one and a half millimeter here, one and a half to two millimeters here. This is one and a half to two millimeters very near to the root. But at the end of the day, the bulky abutments are even more risky for papilla growth. You will never get a papilla here. You will never get a papilla here. You can do as many grafts as you want. So here we have to remove the prosthesis to change the position of the implant here and to redo the whole case with concave abutments and with a new prosthetic. It's just showing you that we have always to think forward. We have to invent. We have to adapt ourselves and our treatment planning to the knowledge and to the delivery of prosthetic parts of digital uh, dentistry and everything else. So it's a, a, a thinking design with an intensive uh, initiative to improve everything we are doing in the daily practice. And again, we should go and have a tendency to promise our patients and to deliver 5, 7, 10, 15, 20 years of success, at least in the complicated and multiple implant cases. So going to our own experience, and I will show you what we did about 17, 18 years ago, we used uh, instruments for minimal extraction, you screw it in the root and uh, of course we can, if, if you send an email, we can deliver all the instruments and everything which is needed to use in, in such cases. So we screw it in in the root and we take the root out without damaging the bone around it. So this was a young lady which was down biking and got a fracture of the left central and a full fracture of the right central, including the root. So we removed gently the root of the right central, we restored the left one, and we used a surgical guide to put the implant in the exact position because we use the natural tooth as a temporary. So you see, how can we guarantee that we can do immediate loading, immediate restoration in single tooth cases in the aesthetic zone. 
We use a pilot reel. Then we use the osteotome. You can use a tap-in old-fashioned osteotome or a screw-in osteotome to improve the bone density. We leave the osteotome in place. We fill the gap between the extraction socket and the osteotome with particulate material. In this case, beta-TCP mixed with blood from the patient. And, of course, we insert our implant after. We insert the implant in the right position with enough space to the buccal. And in cases of implants with a hex, I, I insert my implants always with a flat side to the buccal. This was the 4.7 millimeter uh, tapered screw vent. And as you see, the flat side is always on the buccal. With every implant system we are using today, I try to leave the flat side to the buccal so the technician can produce stuff in advance. This is the abutment pre-prepared by the lab technician. And this is the radiograph. Now, what did we do? We had a 4.7 millimeter implant and we inserted a 3.7 millimeter abutment, as you can see here. So we did about 17, 18 years ago platform switching already. It was not published. It was practice-based and we needed at least 10 years after that until we start publishing it and producing it in every case. So this was a spontaneously delivered platform switching case. Now, this is the temporary crown, final abutment, five months after the surgery. When we inserted the tooth and we polished it, we make a small hole on the palatal side for the surplus of cement. I don't want to have cement in the sulcus, and you know very well the day of surgery, cement can go into the sulcus, it's blood there, you don't see, it's augmented. So I prefer to do a small hole in order to get the surplus of cement out of the crown. And then after four to five months minimum, we take an impression and we don't remove the abutment anymore. This is 10 years after. You still see the, 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 the corner of the central, and this is the crown. So what do we see in this case? Yes, we lost a little bit of papilla. So after traumatic extraction, you will always lose half a millimeter of the papillas. We did not found a solution to put the papilla exactly in the same place. It's impossible. It is possible only with Photoshop, not with biological, long-term successful methods. So this is after 15 years. Everything is stable. Nothing is changing. And this is a predictable result. Yes, you can in inject hyaluron acid in the papilla to increase it to the level which it was before, but this is another procedure which some of the patients don't want to go through it. So this is after 15 years. So you can see that it's a minimal loss due to the extraction, but no more. Now, how can we compensate the same biological type I mentioned before? A very simple method is the insertion of your implant deeper than the bone level. This is a sick biotype. The implant goes half a millimeter to one millimeter below the bone level. This is a medium biotype, like one and a half to two millimeters. The implant goes two millimeters minimum below the bone level, so you create a three millimeters biological width. And this is an extremely thin thin biological type, and then you go three millimeters with your implant. So having that said, we can create now in every case, regardless of the thickness of the soft tissue, we can create a nice biological width if we respect the height of our implant collar.
Another important uh, point we discover in the past almost 20 years is the design of the abutments. I think that it's not only the implant position, the implant diameter, and everything else. We have to discuss about the prosthetic components. We never discussed it before. And, and, and we started 1997, 1999 to modify it, and we published it first time 2004. So let's see what is happening when you use a concave healing abutment, or generally speaking, a concave abutment, the thickness of the soft tissue is reduced here. But if I will remove half of my abutment in this area, the thickness of the soft tissue will be superior. So in the, in the human body, we have space only for one material, or it's gold, titanium, ceramic as an abutment, and thin soft tissue, or we reduce our materials and we let the soft tissue grow into the existing space. So this is exactly what we started doing. So you see very clearly, if you put a healing abutment on an implant, the soft tissue will grow in and will give you automatically a thicker start point. Now, of course, we can say, yes, you can do connective tissue grafts, you can do any graft you want, I understand, and we know that. But my question is, and this is our philosophy, I prefer in my daily practice, and we insert about 1,000 to 1,200 implants every year, to avoid complications. The smart driver avoids accidents. Yes, he can go out, you can, we can escape any any critical situation, but the smart ones avoid the complication. So if we achieve a thicker soft tissue and a nice start for the prosthetic and the right position for the implant vertically and bacopalatally or bacolingually, we will not have to deal with all the complications with occurs. And as you will hear from, from my friend Mario Steigmann, uh, in one of his lectures, and, and we work intensively together, is the fact that most of the complications in the daily practice, especially bone loss and soft tissue loss, are because of mistakes in the planning. Failing to plan is planning to fail. The implant is in the wrong position, the parts are not appropriate, the prosthetic is not appropriate. So, one of the goals of this presentation will be to teach you how to avoid the complication. I understand there are a lot of theories and a lot of ways going to Rome, but I will not suggest that a beginner in implant dentistry will start doing PET, like partial extraction therapy, and leave a piece of the root to get more success. That will give you more complications. It will never give you the long-term success you expect. So we are trying to simplify everything in a daily practice, and I'm extremely happy that we found solutions. So one of the solutions, as you will see here, is a lady, she was at the time of the surgery 60 years old, and she had a fracture of the canine in the middle of the day. The tooth fractured, it's a root canal treated, she had multiple implants, she was in treatment, so she came a kind of desperate. So what could we do? You see the fracture here, you see the position, so what could we do? We removed the root very gently, as I showed you, with uh, uh, extraction instruments, screwing into the root, pulling it out, and after having a fresh extraction socket, we cleaned the socket, we inserted, after pre-drilling an osteotome, as I mentioned before, and we filled the gap with beta TCP and mixed with fresh blood. We leave the osteotome about one minute in place. Now we increase the bone density, we have the cortical bone in the floor of the nose, 
And after removing the osteotome, we insert a 16 millimeter um, tapered design implant with platform switching. Now, this was the stage where we start moving from convex abutments, as you see on the left side, we start reducing the peak around my collar. I understood that nobody needs peak in this area. Nobody needs ceramic there. Nobody needs titanium or gold or whatever. So we start reducing the volume of the abutments. As you can see here, we reduce the volume and we polish the abutment. That's one of the first cases. After reducing the volume of the abutment, one important point is the suture. In order to preserve the papilla, you need to do a vertical mattress suture with 405060 uh, sutures. This is the way you go in from the buccal area. You go through the papilla and then you come back about two to three millimeters from the, the uh, uh, point you came out, you go back, you suture the papilla, you come here three millimeters above the entrance, and then you make an invisible knot. We use the five zero resolvable sutures in this case, and then it's guaranteed that the papilla will stay there. If you put some sutures on the top of the papilla, it's absolutely sure that you will squeeze the papilla and the papilla will go down. So this is what we've done. As you see here, this was the abutment before it was prepped. This is after prepping. Those are the invisible resorbable sutures and this is the pre-prepped abutment peak. So this is the way the patient left home. Look at the position of the implant. The implant is below the extraction socket, about two millimeters. It's on the palatal uh, half of the ridge, and we put a temporary crown on the top of it. This is the way the patient went home. As you can see here, we have some bleeding. We have some papilla resorption due to the extraction. But this is the way she comes back after four days. So the papilla grows spontaneously in the embrasure. If you leave an embrasure, so I suggest you leave an embrasure always in order to get the papilla growing in. And this is the distal papilla. So this is the way the patient comes back after a week. So you see that we have no especially in the mesial area, this is a tooth, this is an implant, this is an implant, this is another implant, which lost a little bit of, of bone anyway, and the crown is in absolute non-occlusion. This is the way we deal with these cases. So the crown, if you, if you want uh, uh, my opinion, it's like an extended abutment, healing abutment, no occlusion, no pressure, the patient has to eat soft nutrition for four to six weeks, and then after four to five months, we put the final restoration. The patient moved and came back after 15 years. The patient came to visit us, and I used this opportunity to take a picture, and you see, this is the papilla. This is the curvature. This is the distal papilla. We didn't lose anything. And this is the bone. I kept the peak abutment and look at the level of the bone growing over the shoulder of the implant and this is the crown. So it shows us there are a lot of possibilities to get long-term success and long-term uh, uh, aesthetic with minimally, to be honest, minimally bone and soft tissue loss. Now, this is a drawing I took from Carl Misch's book. Carl Misch, who was for me personally, a friend, a mentor, and, and, and one of the leaders in the implant field uh, with multiple experiences in surgical, in prosthetic, in everything, biomechanics. So he showed the connection of the hemidesmodontia 
hemidesmodontial cells to the abutment, to a titanium surface. So we are using it when we do immediate placement. We use a sharp burr or a round burr to change the axis of the implant insertion. I will never follow the root in such cases. So we do our pre-drilling, we insert a long implant. When I say long, it has to go at least three to four millimeters into the bone, into the intact bone. So the implant should be 11.5 or 13 millimeters in this area. And the implant insertion should be one and a half to two millimeter below the buccal plate. And the concave abutment with a temporary crown. What's happened in the next few days or few months? The soft tissue grows in, the, the soft tissue grows one millimeter per day. After three to four days, we have a tight connection between the soft tissue and the abutment. And after six months or four months, we got a minimal resorption, 0.5 millimeters of the bone in this area. So after the healing period, we have two possibilities. Or we change the, the abutment into a titanium one, or we keep the peak abutment as a long-term temporization. Our experience with peak abutment goes over seven to 10 years. Now, 2007, we published an article with uh, Frederick Herrmann and Dr. Lerner. We published it in Implant Dentistry. And the factors influencing the preservation of the peri-implant marginal bone was a prefabricated post that can be used both as temporary or as final abutment to avoid frequent replacement of secondary components. So in order to have a stable, unchangeable bone and soft tissue around an implant, if we have a solution to insert a concave abutment the day of surgery, it can be a healing abutment, it can be a final abutment, whatever you think it's appropriate, and leave it there and take later on impressions and use the combination of your implant with the abutment as a natural tooth. This will give you preservation of the bone and of the papilla as we could show 2007 already after at least three to five years of experience. So this is the way you can change a peak abutment into a titanium abutment. It has to have the same shape. And this is what we've done. Sometimes we use titanium immediately, sometimes we use peak immediately, but at the end of the day, the shape should be the same. If we go for concave, it has to be concave all line. Another question which is extremely important for us is which material should we use? Should we use a white ceramic abutment, a titanium abutment, a gold abutment, or a pick abutment? And for aesthetic reasons, what will be the result? So we have to find out the material, the color, the shape, the surface, and last but not least, the connection. So the connection we prefer is a 45 beveled uh, uh, implant and abutment with the conventional hex, which is used, as I mentioned before, 80% of the cases. We use the conventional hex connection described uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 80s. So if you tight your abutment with 35 Newton centimeters, you get a ceiling of this chamber and nothing goes out anymore. We have less, and, and, and I must share it with you, we have less than 1% fractures of the collar with 3.7 millimeter implants after 12 years. So I want to see what's happening. And the fractures start after about 10 years. So we always find solution even for these cases. So this is the way to do it. You tight the abutment and you get a ceiling in this area. So this is for me the most predictable and proof 
connection today for the daily practice. Now about the material. Uh, an article published by Ron Young uh, in Quintessence 2007, the shape, color, and contour of per implant tissue, the role of material and abutment connection, in vitro uh, color change of soft tissue. So the findings were very simple. If the soft tissue is two millimeter thick, we can use any abutment you want. It's two plus millimeters, two and a half, three, four millimeters. You can use any abutment material you want. The long-term aesthetic is guaranteed. If we have less than two millimeter thickness of soft tissue, we should use a white abutment. It can be ceramic, it can be zirconia, it can be peak, whatever you choose, but it has to be white in order to avoid the gray transparency of the thin soft tissue. So this is a very simple statement which helps us designing and choosing the right abutment. Another important article, which is evidence-based at that time, was published in 1997 by Abramson, Berglund, and Linde about the reconnection and disconnection of abutments. So at that time, we were still doing four to five connection and reconnections until the final restoration was done. So if you look what's happening with the soft tissue due this and reconnection, this is exactly as in the movie. Every time we take out a healing abutment, a temporary abutment, an impression abutment, another healing test, the, 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 the aesthetic test, and try in, we lose vertical dimension. And of course, the day you put the final restoration, you already lost one, one and a half millimeter of the papilla, accordingly the bone. So if you can go back and try to, to change the concept in your practice with whatever system you are using, to change it maximum two times. Patient comes in, uncover the implants, put your temporary abutment or put your healing abutment, take an impression, and after a week or two, insert the final restoration, will be perfect. If you put a healing abutment two weeks later, you put a temporary abutment two weeks later, you take an impression, you make a try in after a month and you put a final restoration, I'm convinced you're gonna lose vertical dimension. So, how can we get perfect results in our practice. It's a 4D concept we developed uh, 2000 and 2004 and 2007 and, and we developed it with, uh, with our group, especially discussing with Dr. Ormianer about our experience, which goes back over 20 years now. So we can analyze our cases and I will share with you a case which shows exactly what's happening. So we need 1.5 to 3 millimeters between the implants. 3 millimeters if it's a conventional implant, straight connection to the abutment, and 1.5 millimeters if it's a platform switching with a concave abutment. The next dimension, we need 2 millimeters of bone thickness. This is the minimum for long-term success. And it took years for us to understand the first implants I inserted had one millimeter of bone around it, 1.5. We were not focusing on it. And I see the results. Buccal resorption, lingual resorption, exposed threads. This you don't want to have in your practice. So two millimeters is the minimum thickness. I prefer, as I mentioned, in the aesthetic zone, three millimeters plus. Now, the bone level and the implant collar should be a distance between them one, two, or even three millimeters. In the aesthetic zone, with a thin soft tissue, I would go three millimeters below the bone level in order to get a long-term success for the biological width point of view. And last but not least, the soft tissue thickness, three millimeter of soft tissue thickness, 
and three millimeters minimum of, of a te gingiva. If you don't have a te gingiva, if you don't have three millimeters of soft tissue thickness, I can suggest that you do pre-implant surgeries. Improve the bone, uh, the, the soft tissue thickness, and the te gingiva, and then you insert your implant. If you are very experienced, you can do it in one session and insert your implant. But if you are not sure that you can maintain the success of those two procedures, do your soft tissue thickening before with, with collagen membranes, with connective tissue graft, whatever you, you, you know and you use in your practice on a regular, and create the three millimeters minimum of a gingiva. So those are the parameters. Another important fact in our daily practice is the occlusion. We don't talk enough about occlusion. If I look at all the, the meetings we have and all the, the speakers and the publication, everybody talks about papillas, about bone, about colors, but nobody talks about occlusion. I think personally occlusion is the most important point for long-term success and we have to respect the biomechanics. So we use Arcostigma systems with an electronic measurement of the condyle inclination. And since we articulate our cases, even multiple implant cases with Arcostigma, we have almost no chipping. We have no fracture of the ceramic. So whatever system you are using in your office, please consider transferring the data from the patient mouse in a predictable way in, 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 a, in, an, in an adequate articulator. I understand every country has a different concept, but at the end of the day, for your patient's sake, for the success of your, of your implants and your prosthetic restoration, you should go and make an excellent measurement, especially when we talk about multiple implants and full restoration. This is what we do almost every day. I agree if you have just one single crown, it is not necessary. Two, two, two implants, three implants, your lab technician will find the right solution. But if you go for full arch restoration, it is impeccable if you use a digital measurement for your cases. Now the last part which is the most important part for us and, and, and for this presentation is very simple, how can we do it? Because everybody in the world would like to get this result. And it's not a, a theoretical uh, uh, presentation or suggestions, it is a practical one based on our own experience and based of course on the newest literature and the newest findings in this field. Because going back to the literature and based on old systems and old facts doesn't help us moving forward. So please, if we talk today about doing something in our daily practice, it should be based on new literature, new implant designs, new technologies, new materials, and new parameters. Don't go back in a literature published 20 years ago and tell me, well, they said this and they said that. We will try to go forward with everything I'm presenting today. So let's see, how can we use it? If I go to an article published in the Journal of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry in 1995, developing optimal peri-implant papilla within the aesthetic zone, it was amazing for that time. But now, talking about the 4.5 millimeters and 3.5 between implants, it was not with platform switching implant. It was not with concave abutments. So this article is nice to have, but it's useless today. And, and I think we should move forward and to see the difference between non-platform switching implants non-concave abutments and platform switching implant and concave abutments. So we have to be realistic and adapt our knowledge to the daily treatment we are doing in the practice. So 
Let's start with platform switching. Platform switching for me is one of the most important findings we discovered in the past, let's say, 10 to 20 years. We need to have a difference between the implant diameter and the abutment diameter, and I go a step ahead, and I would like to make the abutment even concave, so to gain more bone and more soft tissue. And of course, this is exactly what everybody needs. We call it the running room. This is the positions of the abutments or design of the abutments. We can use a concave abutment, we can use a straight one or a convex one. Those are the abutments we were used to, 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 to insert in everyday uh, uh, office. So we started changing it. In 2004, we had the publication concerning concave abutments. We started four or five years ago, as I told you, and, and we reduced the abutments manually in the office. And then we asked companies to produce it for us. Because if I am convinced that a device will give me better results, I will work only with companies who will deliver what I ask for based on my experience. I don't care if the company doesn't have the same experience because the key opinion leader are different. I need something which is adapted to experience, to evidence base later on, and to patients long-term success. This is the main goal we should have in our practice. So 2004, we started using systematically concave healing abutments, concave temporary abutments with pre prep margins, concave impression abutments, individual abutments, and straight and, and uh, uh, angled abutments concave. It is important that all concavities are the same and all concavities will go through your different lines, small diameter, medium diameter, big diameter. This is for a 3.2 millimeter implant. So we understood that concavity plays a major role in our, in our work. And we started moving into platform switching. So the article published 2011 by Canulo uh, and uh, showing us that the wider the platform switching, it means the difference between the implant width and the abutment, the wider this platform is, the less bone loss we have. In this specific article, they used a 3.8 millimeter abutment on a 4.3, 4.8, and 5.5 millimeter implant collar. So if we compare the non-platform switch implant mean bone resorption is 1.358 millimeters, and we compare it to the different platform switching diameters, so the maximum on a 4.3 millimeter uh, implant, the average was 0.8. On a 4.8 millimeter implant, the average results were 4.0.8. Uh, and on a 5.5 millimeter implant, the average resorption was 0.35, which is five times less than on a conventional implant. So now we know that the platform switching concept functions in the daily practice. So now, what happened when we disconnect a concave abutment or we leave the abutment there? This is a demonstration of a multi-unit concave abutment. And the moment you insert the concave abutment in the implant, immediately after surgery or after uncovering, and you use different parts to take impression, to put the final crown, to put the temporary crown, the soft tissue stability is guaranteed. As you see here, is no resorption. So the secret will be concave and no changing the parts. 
If we have cases, we need to increase the papilla. There will always be extreme cases. The only way to increase the papilla is changing from the temporary concave abutment into a convex final abutment. This is the only way you can increase your papilla by 0.5 to 1 millimeter. But again, this is in extreme cases. Don't do it in every case because you squeeze the papilla and it has to be uh, uh, well uh, supported with blood supply. So this is a specific solution for extreme cases if you have sick soft tissue. So again, you change from a concave to a convex abutment if we have thick soft tissue and then we can have an increase of 0.5 to one millimeter. Now, the platform switching has been researched between 2000 and 2011 extremely. So now we know a lot about the, 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 the platform switching and of course implementing the concave abutment. This is uh, a kind of comparison for you. If you look at the average bone resorption at non-platform switch implants, it was in average 1.3 in the first year. And if we compare it to a platform switch implant, it will be less. It's 0.6 only. So 1.3 to 1.4 comparing to 0.6, it is a huge difference. So this is an article published 2008 by Dennis Tano and his group at NYU. And the height of inter-implant bone crest when using platform switch implants. Now, not only the height of the bone is important, but the distance between the implants. If you compare a non-platform switch case where the distance between the implant should be three millimeters and the bone resorption is 1.3 to 1.4, comparing to a platform switch implant, where the resorption of the bone is 0.6 and the distance between the implant can be reduced to 1.5, this is a huge advantage for the daily practitioners. Now the group in NYU had found the reason for it because everything was pretended to be distance between implants and bone resorption. So Christian Stoppard and his group uh, reviewed and published in 2011. Non-platform switch implant, horizontal bone level. Now if you look at the result, it shows you that the non-platform switch implant shows circular fibers at the first implant thread. So we have at the first implant thread the circular fibers, which it's like a pullover around your neck. So this is the reason for the bone resorption, comparing with a platform switch implant. So the beauty is the platform switch implant shows circular fibers at the level of the platform. So now it makes a lot of sense. The wider the platform is, the more fibers we have, the more stability we have for the bone. So this is exactly what we need to understand and to implement it in our office. So now we understand the hot topic, why platform switching and concave abutments are delivering the newest hot topic, the papilla. So again, now you see the same article in a different perspective. The wider your your platform switching is, and the more the concavity of your abutment, the less bone loss you will have. So you can play with it between 0.8 and 0.3 millimeter of bone. So now you understand why when we had this, this platform switching and the concave abutment 2007, why we had a stability of the bone and the papillas around our implants. It was very clear that we reduced the number of changes, 
We need one abutment one time if possible, but even if we change it, we switch between a concave temporary abutment to a final concave abutment and a healing abutment. So now we move forward to the implementation of all those findings. So now you will see how can we do an implant planning. The implant planning in the daily practice due to dental master software give us the possibility in less than one minute to explain to the patient the case. So if you look at the right side of your screen comparing to the left side, we remove the teeth we are planning to take out. We show the patient where we insert our implants and we show the patient virtually the final restoration. This is an excellent tool to implement in your daily practice if you want to show patient treatment planning. The beauty is that the whole package is cloud-based so you can, if you, if you have a patient in different offices, you have somebody you meet on the beach or a neighbor, you can show every treatment plan in almost real time and it takes you less than a minute. So let's see this case. This is the way the patient came in. Diastema. Lost teeth. She was 50 years old at the time. And we decided to make a wax up, to make a mock up, and this is the way she left the office. We closed the embrasure. We explained to her the extractions, the replacement of her teeth, and changing the, her appearance, we had to insert the implant in a completely other position than her tooth was. So this is the way she left home. We just, you, when, you, when you see where she came from, so of course we just restored the, from premolar to premolar, upper jaw and lower jaw. We didn't load the implant immediately because it was no initial stability of 35 Newton centimeters and this is the way she left the office. Now this is the way she looks with the final restoration. This is the beginning and this is after five years. So as you see, we could change dramatically the function, the aesthetic, the biology, the biological ways. We are able to do it if we follow the rules. As you will see here, the implant, if you see this implant, is about two to three millimeters below the bone level because I knew I have to play with the soft tissue. We have to create a new papilla. So those are our experiences. If you look at all our implants are below the bone level, below the bone level. The deeper I insert my implants, the better I preserve the bone, but again, more than three millimeters make no sense to me, but I know there are some literature, they go deeper. So one, two or three millimeters are an average vertical dimension I will insert my implants. Now look what happened. The patients come after 10 years. We have a problem. If you look at this picture and you look at this picture, what happened? It's very clear, and this is based on our experience on hundreds of other cases. And please take it as a fact. When you put an implant near a natural tooth, following things are happening between five and seven years. The natural tooth moves, as you see, we had a closure of, of, the, of the embrasure here. It moved and it's elongated. So in every case in my practice, and we will publish this with Dr. Romianer soon, in all the cases we combine a tooth with an implant, the natural teeth are continuing growing, the implants are not moving. So be aware and tell your patients that when they come for cleaning or they come for anything else, we can adjust it, but we cannot modify 
the biology. So it will be a movement of the natural teeth and an elongation. So yes, we use the digital world on a daily practice. We can design a virtual bar with virtual denture to know exactly how to proceed with a prosthetic and how to do the surgery. The same is with single crowns. We can do a virtual crown, virtual abutment, and find out the exact position for the tooth. Regardless of the software you are using, you can play with the software to create a, a virtual wax up and out of the virtual wax up a virtual mock up and then based on your virtual plannings to find out the height and the length of the screws, the position of your implants and something very simple and very predictable when you know your virtual prosthetic, virtual abutment perfect implant position, you can now send your abutment to a CAD CAM center or use it in your own office and the STL file can be milled. And you decide if you want to mill a peak abutment, a zirconia abutment or a titanium abutment. So the possibilities today are unlimited. You can mill it, you can print it, you can do whatever you think it's appropriate we prefer to deliver peak abutments at the beginning of the treatment for the temporization. Then we go to zirconia abutment if needed or titanium abutments. And this is the last case. This is uh, an accident. The patient had a car accident and she broke the frontal teeth. One of the disadvantages of this patient, and you can see here, it was a little bit of hygiene problems, but the biggest problem was smoking. The lady smokes two packs per day and she didn't want to change her habits. So due to the accident, we had to open a flap and to see if there are some other fracture of the bone. There were no fractures. We inserted nine implants in the upper jaw and six implants in the lower jaw with immediate restoration. We used peak abutments. So this is a kind of implementing all our knowledge in these cases. So what you see here is the final soft tissue design due to a perfect planning of the temporary. We plan the temporaries virtually as I showed you. We can mill them and finalize it prior to surgery. So I'm using a surgical guide. I use the temporary bridge and I create my papillas. If you look at the situation after removing the temporary bridge, you see how we created the papillas even where the pontic is gonna be, we already have papillas. And this is what we want to create and this is what I mentioned uh, 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 during the lecture. Try to avoid complication. Insert the implant in the right position, right height, right materials, and right temporary. So what we are seeing now, when we remove the peak abutments out of the socket, we got bleeding. It means that it was a connection between the hemidesmodontial cells and the peak abutment or a titanium abutment. So bleeding is always good. We take an impression and after 10 days, we insert the final restoration in the patient's mouth. Now the day of delivery, you cannot expect a perfect aesthetic. So the day of delivery, you cement the crown, you screw abutments in, it's, everything is irritated. So we need to understand that the patient must, you, must use a soft tissue brush for the next two weeks, and then we will create the perfect aesthetic, which is expected by the patient. She came back after three years, we see a much better soft tissue situation. She improved her hygiene. This is after five years. Still a stable soft tissue status. Now she comes after eight years. She continues smoking. And then she disappeared for another few years. But still, after cleaning, she got a stable soft tissue predictable result.
Now this is after 10 years. You see the implant position, you see the abutments, you see the bone. So let's see what happened after 15 years. I didn't clean the case when she came into the office. I just took a picture to show you. The hygiene is mediocre, medium, but you still have the soft tissue after 15 years. We have maybe half a millimeter of resorption, and this is the best result you can get after 15 years. So let's summarize the no bone loss in the daily practice. We need to respect seven points. One, anatomy. We need four to seven millimeter bone width and three millimeters attached gingiva. We need soft tissue quality, two to three millimeter thickness. We need a condition of the adjacent teeth, no mobility. If I have mobile teeth, I will extract them. The distance to the adjacent is 1.5 to 2 millimeters. The platform switching concept, it's a must. Tapered implant and small diameter implant and abutment design must be a concave abutment. So if you implement all those findings, all those experienced parameters, you will end up by having long-term success with less complications. So this is the way we start our professional life. So everything looks very sexy and, and actually looks amazing. But after having all the complication and everything else, this is the way we end up. And I hope you will all stay safe, healthy. And of course, I hope to see you at our meetings, to see you at courses, at credential events, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, all of you, for the time we spent together. You can look at the website and send me emails. Thank you very much.